we've got two speakers today. We've got uh, Hossam from Egypt and we've also got Mark Bergfeld. Um, our first speaker is going to be Hossam, um, who, as you all know, is a leading member of the revolutionary socialist in Egypt. Um, he was also um, named by The Independent as the most influential political tweeter in the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, yesterday with uh, my comrade uh, Wasim and the other Egyptian comrades and one remark we had is that after attending all of those meetings yesterday uh, we were surprised that actually no one was recording or using their mobile phones to record this lecture I mean if this was happening in Egypt probably you would find good number of people I would not say like half the audience but good number of people who, are, who would be taking videos of what's going on and at least there will be one person, one person who will be live streaming the event. I mean, this is not something organizational, this is something spontaneous that everybody does, you know, I mean, more or less uh, uh, in Egypt. And uh, we don't really see it that much here in uh, Britain. And when we even looked at the hashtag, you know, I mean, Marks2012, which is for this uh, conference, we more or less like found out that maybe three or four people only like tweeted about like the lectures that we've been attending, uh, which is also I mean completely different uh, from what goes on back home. I think Egypt provides a fantastic case for what Trotsky describes as the combined and uneven development. A nation of 90 million people. That's like the Egyptian you know, population. A nation of 90 million people. 40% of which are under the poverty line, yet the mobile phone saturation is 112% according <laughs> to the government stats. Meaning that more than 76 million Egyptians have mobile phones and we have more or less like 92.7 million SIM cards in Egypt. Um, I mean, the combined and uneven development, you see it in our daily lives. I mean, anybody of you who might have visited Cairo, I mean, you would notice this immediately. You will find in the same street the Mercedes beside the donkey cart. You will find, you know, I mean, the posh neighborhood, you know, beside it, you will find the slum. You will enter the slum, but you will find inside the slum like satellite dishes, you know, and cables and, you know, internet wirings and all of these things. And that's a feature of, uh, uh, of the society we're living in. I'm going to speak like as briefly as possible about the Egyptian experience over the past decade and then I'm going to hand over the mic um, to uh, my comrade here. Internet activism more or less like started around the year 2000 in Egypt. Uh, from 1992 onwards, um, the Egyptian regime had signed uh, a neoliberal agreement with the IMF and the World Bank under the name ERSAP, the Economic Reform and Structural Adjustment Program. And more or less, it happened within the same year as our war on terror started. War on terror and neoliberalism always go hand in hand in most countries. Um, part or cornerstone of this neoliberal program was to create an IT hub in Egypt that would compete with India and other places in the world when it comes to outsourcing IT jobs. So the ironic thing that happened is that you had a government or a regime that's like committed to the destruction of the working class, to the destruction of uh, any sort of social welfare, but at the same time, in order to do this, they were also creating more or less this strong infrastructure of telecommunication in Egypt. By the year 2000, and that's when the Palestinian Intifada broke out, the second Palestinian Intifada, the government statistics puts, the, uh, the government stats put the number of those in Egypt who had access to the internet at roughly 400,000 people, only 400,000. The last report that came out by the Ministry of Telecommunication in May put the number of Egyptians who have access to the internet at 30 million. So in one decade, from less than half a million, we've reached 30 million uh, people. Uh, and again, I mean, as I told you, in terms of uh, mobile networks, our mobile phone infiltration or saturation, it's basically booming everywhere. Which means that the biggest 
social network, more or less, that we have in Egypt is Bluetooth, not the internet. Um, there is so much like myth and there is so much like painting of a rosy picture about like social media and activism in Egypt. But most of those who are trying to theorize about it or report about it forget the fact that most of the Egyptian bloggers or most of those who are into social media, they have one foot in the cyberspace and the other foot is on the ground. And the two go hand in hand, more or less. The start of the Egyptian blogosphere, as we call it, started by the late, like December 2004. And we put the number of Egyptian blogs at the time at only like 30 Egyptian blogs, more or less. The politicization of the blogosphere started in 2005, following what's called Black Wednesday. This was the day that the government um, organized sexual assaults against women reporters and women activists in broad daylight in front of everybody in a day where we were protesting the constitutional amendments that Mubarak was uh, uh, putting forward. There were few bloggers present in that protest. They went back home. Of course, no mainstream media even reported on what was going on. And they were the only ones who took like, pictures, videos, blah, 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 and they started uploading them online. And they made a call for citizen journalists to join them. The blogosphere has been booming since then. From only 30 blogs in December 2004, they reached roughly in 2006, like 1,500. And then a government report came out in 2008 putting the number of Egyptian blogs at 282,000 blogs that we had in Egypt. Now it's impossible, I mean, to map it, because it's not just blogs. You have different platforms. There are people using Facebook, there are people using Twitter, there are people using the different platforms uh, of the blogs. The <coughs> other turning point that I should stop at is 2008, the Bahalla uprising, which it was an uprising by the urban poor and the workers uh, uh, in that Nile Delta town, which includes uh, uh, the textile mill. It's like the third largest in the world and the largest in the Middle East, called Ghazd al Mahalla. And prior to the 6th of April 2008, there were white calls for a general strike, mainly on Facebook, uh, by the political activists. And when the uprising happened, most of the media, in addition to the, especially the Western media, they were obsessed with this like Facebook activism. And they gave credit, you know, to the uprising to that Facebook uh, group, the 6th of April. But it's a mistake. What happened in 2008 is that the workers on the ground who do not actually have access to the internet, most of them at the time at least, they had issued a warning that they were striking two months before. And they went and they met the several, like, you know, political leaders of the several movements and they, to call for solidarity. So some political activists decided to call for a general strike, you know, I mean, on that day. And the call was, like, picked up very quickly, you know, I mean, in the social media sphere. But the thing is, when you look at it, the general strike actually failed. There is no general strike that happened on that day. As revolutionary socialists in Egypt at the time, our position was that we are not endorsing the general strike call. Why? Because you cannot organize general strikes via Facebook. And that we were only mobilizing on the ground in the places where we had support or we had presence on the ground. And that includes, of course, Ghazd al-Mahalla, whose strike leadership was largely revolutionary socialists, in other textile mills uh, 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 that are related to Ghazd al-Mahalla, the universities that we had presence uh, at the time. So if you look at it, at the end of the day, those who actually moved on the ground in 2008 were the locations that the political uh, activist community had presence on. It's not like, you know, I mean, people read it on Facebook, you know, oh, there is like general strike tomorrow, so, you know, I mean, let's do it. But the whole narrative became that the uprising was caused by this uh, Facebook page. And that same narrative also continued up until, I mean, more or less, I mean, today. After all, I mean, the Egyptian revolution was described as a Facebook revolution, which, of course, uh, negates the truth. And more or less, it wipes out the idea that there were 10 years of struggle in the run up to January 25th, 2011. And January 25th, 2011 was more or less like the climax, or like, you know, you reach like the peak. That's when everything like exploded. And if revolutions were simply organized 
by a Facebook event that you can click on attending, then why didn't all the general strikes, the calls for general strikes, you know, I mean, before 2011, that were uttered on Facebook or were uh, circulated on Facebook, why did they fail? I mean, they didn't happen. Uh, like every two months, you know, I mean, some political activist community would get on Facebook and call for a general strike. And of course, this didn't happen. January 25th was different. Why? I mean, no one can predict when revolutions, you know, I mean, happened, but we had reached more or less like the crunch stage where things could not continue anymore as they are. <laughs> the power of social media in Egypt is largely related to its unofficial marriage to the mainstream media. That's what also some people do not uh, uh, notice. Meaning, my blog, which had been described as, you know, and I'm proud of that, you know, as one of the most influential blogs, blah, blah, blah. How many people read my blog? At the end of the day, you know, when I look at the stats, the highest day I ever got hits at it were 11,000 readers. That's all. 11,000 readers. My Twitter uh, account, for example, I mean, I have like 90,000 people, you know what I mean, on it. Out of 90 million Egyptians, that's really nothing. But the power of social media among the activist community had come from the fact that many journalists, whether in Egypt or abroad, are monitoring, you know what I mean, social media. You know, journalists are extremely lazy. Instead of like, you know, I mean, their old methods of like using the telephone, so what happened today? Okay, so you know this, blah, blah, blah. Now they are sitting in front of their laptops, monitoring what's happening, and then, you know, okay, so this happened, blah, 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 this happened, blah, 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 you know. So if I write a tweet, for example, about like some information, or I put some information on my blog, I'm assured 200% that it will get into Reuters. And if it gets into Reuters, this means millions of people around the world will know about it. Or Al Jazeera, you know, will be monitoring it. So it would reach at least 100 million people. Or the BBC is monitoring it. So it would reach also millions of other people. I mean, this was really the power of social media, more or less, until recently. Because there were few changes that I can, we can discuss later, maybe. Um, during the uprising itself, during the 18 days, I mean, the telecommunications were disrupted. Uh, Mubarak shut down completely all sorts of telecommunications on the Friday of anger. And then the service was like disrupted several times all throughout the 18 days. But still, the revolution continued. It was not really dependent on the internet at the time. But how did we mobilize for those like one million men and women marches and those like, you know, mass protests in Tahrir when telecom telecommunications were shut down in addition, of course, to the general state of disarray, you know, I mean, among all the organizations, including us, during the uprising. It was simple. If we are in Tahrir and the organizers have sat down and discussed and agreed that tomorrow we're going to have a one million man protest, then one of us would like draft a statement and then go to Al Jazeera and tell them, we are having tomorrow one million man protest. So Al Jazeera would go in, you know, I mean, tomorrow the activist community are like having one million man protest. So all our comrades in all the other provinces would actually know that we're holding, you know, I mean, a protest tomorrow, in addition to the ordinary Egyptians who want to join, and that's how they joined. You know, so, I mean, it, it was more or less an unofficial marriage between the two. But it also means that, more or less, you're also at the mercy of those mainstream media organizations, more or less. I mean, okay, I mean, Al Jazeera is more or less anti-Mubarak because of the politics uh, between Qatar and Egypt, so they were more than happy, you know, I mean, to spread our messages. But others, you know, I mean, were not. And Al Jazeera's position itself keeps on changing. I mean, what if, like, the Emir of Qatar meets, like, you know, now Field Marshal from Tawi, they agree on something. No reports whatsoever about Egypt, you know, it will come out on Al Jazeera. But, and I want to finalize maybe with this point, our dependence on the mainstream media is actually shrinking by the time. Why? Because of the boom in the social media and in the number of people who have access to the internet. The latest government stats puts 38% of the Egyptian families, they have access now to the internet from their homes. Um, I know tons of comrades who actually joined the movement via Twitter. I mean, they were following, like, you know, I mean, our news, you know, via our Twitter, and they were like, how can we, you know, I mean, reach those guys? When the mainstream media doesn't want to report on anything that we're doing, we actually now have our social network that has millions of Egyptians now on it. It's not as tiny as it used to be. And we can use it as some sort of a parallel media operation for that. There were numerous, numerous occasions 
where strikes and protests were organized, you know, I mean, basically by the courts, you know, I mean, online. But they materialized because there were activists on the ground who, who can implement this. I can tell you also about numerous occasions where calls for general strikes or mass protests happened on the internet, but nothing materialized on the ground. Because you would call for a protest, but which organization will go to with the banners and they will be ready and they will tell people, you know, I mean, go here, go there, you know, I mean, that's how we do it, blah, blah, blah. And in occasions, it completely failed. But the last point I want to talk about, comrades, is that I think the socialist movement needs to open a real discussion about the use of social media. Uh, as much as I'm really honored by what I hear from some comrades about the, how the Egyptian revolutionary socialists are using social media and they are way far ahead compared to other groups in the tendency, I have to admit that for a very long time, our use of social media was left to our individual initiatives. Not like, you know, I mean, some overall organizational strategy that can push forward, you know, I mean, in that direction. And we need also to think about something else in this world we're in, where things keep changing by the minute. What sort of organizer do we need at the moment? The paper is irreplaceable. We will continue to sell our paper, our papers in the streets. We will continue to engage in whatever protests we have, you know, with our newspapers. You gotta have this. But at the same time, if a coup happens today, you know, I mean, in Egypt, for example, I'm not gonna wait till next week in order for the socialists, our newspaper, to come out so as to know, you know, I mean, what sort of position are we taking regarding this? Um, if, if, and, and I would assume also that this is also the situation here in Britain. You have not reached the revolutionary situation yet. And I do believe that you will reach it, you know, I mean, one day. There is nothing special about Britain. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even in the day or, or the age we're living in, you know, and there are political developments happening, you know, I mean, around the minute, you're not going to wait for a socialist worker to come out next week to tell you what to do. You know, I mean, today, you need something that's fast, that's quick, but at the same time, that can reach, you know, I mean, your audience internally and outside. And I think we need to start rethinking about what sort of organizer we need at the moment and explore the untapped potentials that the cyberspace is providing us, which, again, does not replace our actions on the ground. Thank you.